Okay. Okay, looks like we are live. Had a little sound issue, so I apologize for that. So, welcome back. This is week nine, primate behavior, chapter 11 in our lab manuals. And so we'll be taking the basics that we learned about primates last week, and we'll be looking at some details of how primates act. And remember that we are primates, so although most of the information here will be looking at great apes and monkeys. Um, throughout the lecture, you should be thinking about how these same things apply to you and your behavior and the behavior of people around you that you observe. So first up, uh, some quick class business. Uh, all the grading is caught up. So your exam two grades and all your homework grades should be posted uh, in gradebook. And since class in person is canceled for the rest of the semester, um, you won't be getting your physical exams back anytime soon. I do save everything for several years, so eventually you can have them if you want them. But in the meantime, if you have questions about your exam score or want to review your exam, let me know and I'll provide you with some feedback. I'm not sure right now what format that will be in. I might have a scanner here that works. I haven't set it up yet, in which case I could scan all your work and send it back to you, but that's kind of a hassle. Or I could write up the answers to the questions you got wrong with some explanations and send you that as an email. Uh, that might be easier. So if you don't care about the feedback, then I won't send you anything. But if you want feedback on what you got wrong, then I'll provide it. And then if your exam score wasn't what you hoped it would be, there is the extra credit assignment which I posted in last week's module. That's worth a lot of points, so take a look at that. And that's not due until the day of the final. And of course, as always, if you have any questions, um, just contact me and I'll answer them. Also, a few people had questions about um, the format for the homework and what they should or shouldn't turn in. As far as I'm concerned, all that's important to me right now is that you get the homework to me in some way, shape, or form. Um, whatever works for you, I will accept it. I'm trying to be as flexible as possible. If you, you know, didn't have internet access at all, I could talk to you on the phone and go through the answers with you or something like that. My main concern is that you take a look at the material and are comfortable with it, um, and that then you show me that you did that in some way. So whatever uh, works for you also works for me in that regard. Okay, what are our learning objectives for today? We're going to go over the different categories of primate behavior that are commonly researched, and we're going to look at exactly how that research gets done. We're going to distinguish between affiliative and aggressive behaviors in primates. Those are the two main categories of behavior. We're going to look briefly at primate ecology and how mating behavior affects the social organization of different kinds of primates. We're going to take a quick look at primate communication and how that provides a basis for understanding human communication. And throughout the lecture, I'd like you guys to think about how non-human primate behavior is similar to or different from human behavior. Remember that we're thinking about the comparative method here. So we're comparing ourselves to these primates. Sometimes they do things that are very recognizable, and sometimes they do things that seem a little strange. And in both cases, you want to see how that relates to our own behavior. And today's lecture is pretty short because normally I have video clips throughout the lecture that demonstrate the various bit points that I'm making. So what I've done instead is made a short YouTube playlist that collects all these videos. That's also here on the channel and I'll post a link to the playlist. Uh, it's called Chapter 11 Additional Materials. Watch as many of those as you can. They're mostly pretty short clips that just give examples of various things we're going to discuss in this lecture. You can watch them, you know, one at a time or all at once, whatever you like. And there's also a page in this week's module that has a list of all those videos and for each one, a brief uh, set of notes on what I would like you to look for in that video. Okay, so primate behavior can be divided into several different categories that we concern ourselves with. Uh, socialization, how do individuals interact with each other? Aggression, how do they interact with each other when they're not very happy with each other? 
communication. How do they communicate? Um, primates don't are not able to speak in the same way we are, but they're able to vocalize. Remember that none of these individuals have a hyoid bone, so they're not able to utilize complex language the way we are, but they are able to vocalize, and there's some hints that there's a cognitive basis for the same kind of communication that we do in some of these individuals. And from there, we're going to look at intelligence. So it's doubtless that primates have some form of intelligence. We're always trying to figure out more about what exactly that intelligence constitutes. We'll look at their learned behavior and some examples of tool use. And then at the end, we'll ask if primates have culture. Often we only think of humans as having culture, but there's some arguments that many kinds of animals, but primates in particular, also have culture uh, within certain restrictions. So the first thing is, how do we study primate behavior? Um, there are two kinds of study techniques that we use, and they have their own limitations. Field studies and captive studies. So field studies are what you probably think of when you think of a primatologist. You go out into the wild, wherever the primates live in nature, and you observe them directly. Um, that has several drawbacks. It can be expensive because all the primates in the world don't live in North America, so you have to go somewhere else. Often primate populations that are healthy and surviving live in remote areas because they're often threatened by environmental degradation. So, you know, near cities, there are very rarely any primates. You often have to go out deep into the jungle somewhere, and that has a lot of challenges associated with it. But this is the way to get the best possible data because you are seeing these individuals as they naturally are in the wild, uh, often with limited interference because they're off in some remote area. So the data you gather is really high quality and you can see a lot of unexpected things because you're just watching them in their daily lives and things might pop up that you never expected to see. And there's a couple of examples of that in this lecture. On the other hand, you have captive studies. Captive studies take place with captive populations. So those are primates that are in zoos, uh, in research labs, which is becoming a thing of the past. Um, and so because those primates are in a fixed location, it's much easier to plan, organize, and carry out these kinds of studies. Uh, and often you have individuals that live for a much longer time because animal lifespan is longer in captivity than it is in the wild. But the downside, of course, is your data is limited. You're not gonna see the whole range of wild natural behaviors. And certain behaviors might be impossible to document because the animals won't do them when people are watching or they don't do them in captivity. So on the bottom there, we have a chimpanzee that was trained to do various uh, memory tricks with numbers, which of course you'd never see in the wild. But that also raises the question of if uh, captive primates have different behaviors than wild primates. So then, Regardless of whether we're doing a field study or a captive study, we're interested in different categories of primate behavior. And those can be broken down into basically two types, affiliative and aggressive behaviors. Affiliative behaviors are behaviors that build social connections between individuals or within their own within their groups. So they're always cooperative. So you have your affiliates. Those are all the individuals that you're associated with in a positive way. For humans, that would be first your family, and then your friends, um, your mates. So a boyfriend or girlfriend, right? A husband or wife. Uh, those are all people that you cooperate with. Then going out from there, you would have people you work with, um, people you you know acquaintances that you socialize with, and you might have people that you get along with some of the time, but not all of the time. Those are still affiliates, uh, and we would look at how well you do or don't get along with them. And primates have those same kinds of relationships. And then on the other hand, you have aggressive behaviors. Those are behaviors where there's conflict, and they're antagonistic. And that is everything from just individuals in your own group that you don't get along with, you know, rivals, um, to people outside your group, right? it might be enemies, it might be whole separate groups that are antagonistic to your group that you might have conflict with. And in all those cases, we would look at aggressive behavior. So there's a few main kinds of affiliative behavior that we want to consider. One of the most common primate behaviors is grooming. And these are all pictures that give examples of grooming. Um, basically, you are 
going through the fur, hair, uh, uh, other body parts of another member of your group, and you're cleaning in primates often picking out bugs um, and generally taking care of their health and appearance. What we see in primates is that lower ranked individuals typically groom higher ranked individuals more. So grooming is not just a way of taking care of your family or your friends. It's often a way of showing a higher ranking individual that you um, want their attention and that you are doing something for them, which they will hopefully return by being nice to you. Right? So in chimpanzees especially, often, like in this picture, the higher ranking individual, like a matriarch or a group leader, will get groomed by lower ranking individuals. In humans, that behavior plays out a little differently some of the time, but you might ask yourself um, where you could see examples in society where lower ranked individuals do the grooming for higher ranked individuals on a consistent basis. Okay, another common affiliative behavior that we're familiar with is hand holding. So of course, humans hold hands all the time, right? Between mates, between uh, adults and children, um, between friends even. We also see that in primates. So this shows affiliation between kin or mates, that physical bond uh, builds a certain connection between individuals. So it's extremely common between mothers and offspring, but it's also seen across all affiliative bonds. So with, like with this example of these macaques in the upper right here, there are examples where you have whole troops of monkeys sitting around holding hands and trading off hand holding over time. Okay, what about aggressive behavior? So aggressive behavior is sp strictly controlled in primates. One of the things to think about with wild animals is that they have to manage their risk a lot. There's no medical care. So if you get hurt in a fight, then you're hurt perhaps indefinitely, and that can lead to an inability to gather food and to death. So most aggressive behavior by primates is not fighting, it's threat displays saying, if you persist, we're going to fight, and you should think about who is bigger or stronger before you do that, and we can just agree on who is bigger or stronger, um, and then the other person will back down. So a lot of aggressive behavior com, uh, consists of displaying your ability to fight. So that can take a few different forms. You can make your hair stand up on end. We can't do that, but most animals can. Think of a cat or a dog. They can do the same thing. You kind of bristle your skin and it makes your hair stand up. And the chimpanzees in the lower right are doing that. Uh, throwing things. Right? Making loud vocalizations, chimpanzees hoot or scream, and humans also scream or holler. Right, Change the kinds of words that you're using to express that you're upset and you're uh, ready for conflict. Another really common one is yawning. Uh, they're not So when a chimpanzee yawns at you, he's not sleepy. He's showing you that he's upset and he might want to fight. Uh, and that way he can display his teeth, which are his main weapon. He'll use his teeth to bite you. And many primates, therefore, have enlarged canines as a sexually selected trait. So think all the way back to uh, week one and two with sexual selection. A lot of species like baboons have large fangs. And although they do use those to eat meat, they're not primarily meat eaters. The purpose of the fangs is mostly to uh, for, for threat displays, right? And so larger, more powerful males tend to have larger fangs, and those fangs are sexually selected for. But Opening your mouth and displaying your teeth is also a threat display in humans. We just don't necessarily think about it that way uh, when we're faced with the behavior of, say, chimpanzees. Now, there is an example of a primate that does commit a lot of violence uh, beyond just threat displays, and that's chimpanzees. So chimpanzees have been documented carrying out raids where they get bands of males together and go to the territory of another group and pick out one chimpanzee and attack them. Um, they also patrol the borders of their territories and they might attack rivals within their own group. So there is uh, chimpanzee on chimpanzee violence within family groups. And this is really interesting because chimpanzees are our closest living relatives. So there's been some suggestion that the relatively high amount of violence seen in humans can be traced back to 
chimpanzee behavior and that the way they behave can tell us something about the origins of warfare uh, and conflict between groups. The other big aggressive behavior that we see across primates, not just in chimpanzees, is infanticide. That's when uh, male individuals seek out infants in the group and kill them. And this happens uh, for a sort of complicated biological reason. So we usually see it when either a new male becomes dominant in a group or when new females enter the group with infants that they um, bore outside of that group. And the reason for this is because all primates, except for us, have something called lactational amenorrhea, which is that when they have a child that they're nursing, uh, they're temporarily uh, infertile. So they're not able to, <clears throat> to mate. And if that infant dies, then the hormones that cause that go away and the female is able to mate again. And so the reason for this happening is that the new male wants to mate with all the females um, so that he can spread his genes, right? Survive and reproduce. And he can't do that if they're nursing. So the fastest way to get access to them is to kill their children. Uh, this happens in chimpanzees, in gorillas, in macaques, in a wide variety of species, but uh, not in humans, fortunately. All right, on the flip side, going back to affiliative behavior, we also have the case of bonobos. And bonobos are interesting. They're extremely close related to the chimpanzees, and they're nearly indistinguishable except for some minor characteristics. And they don't commit very much violence. They frequently use sex as a form of social bonding. And I have an example of this in the video list. And their groups are also female dominated. So matriarchs tend to be the most powerful and influential and they hand out uh, favors basically to other individuals in contrast to chimpanzees. And this is interesting because they're also our closest relatives. There's virtually no genetic difference between chimps and bonobos and they're equally related to us. So on the one hand, we have the example of chimps who are violent and are used as an example of how we use violence. But on the other hand, we have bonobos who use sex and are maybe an example of how we use sex in our society. One of the interesting things about bonobos is that they use a lot of different sexual positions that are similar to humans, uh, which most animals do not do, including chimpanzees. All right, whenever we're looking at primates and how they behave, we want to look at their ecology. So this is recognizing that the way primates act uh, is structured a lot by the limitations imposed by their environment, right? If you live in the jungle, there's certain things you can and cannot do. And if you live on the plains, there's other things you can and cannot do. And this shapes your behavior. So a lot of this comes down to diet. And we'll be looking at diet in more detail, I think, next week. But for now, just keep in mind that your social structure is shaped in part by the food availability, and in the risk of you becoming food in turn. So primates who eat, for instance, insects or fruit tend to live in small groups because there's not a ton of insects or a ton of fruit all in one place. You have to go to the locations where they are, hunt basically or forage to gather it. And so for instance, the tarsier in the upper right there who mostly eats insects, they tend to live in the very small groups, often just one or two individuals. And they're mostly arboreal. That's where their food is because since they're small, they're vulnerable to being eaten by other animals like eagles or snakes. On the other hand, if your food source is abundant, like leaves in the jungle, right, then you tend to live in large groups because you need to spread out uh, to gather all that food. You need to consume a lot of it because it's relatively low in calories. And so instead of relying on size and arboreal behavior for protection, you rely on numbers. And right? so no one's going to attack this pack of gorillas here. That would be extremely unwise. And so they can afford to sit around all day eating leaves in the same way that a herd of cows might chew on grass. Chimpanzees do both things because remember that chimpanzees have a generalist diet. They eat everything. And so their social structure incorporates both of these strategies, and we call that a fission fusion structure. So you have a group of chimpanzees, and they fission, they split up into small groups, often family-based, when they're foraging for rare foods like fruit or meat. And then they fuse back together, so those groups come together in a central place uh, at night, for, so they sleep all in one large group so that they're protected, or when they're eating things like leaves, then they have a more similar behavior to gorillas. 
And this is interesting because this is also the strategy used by many uh, hunter-gatherer societies. So the Yanomamo in, Belize, in uh, Brazil rather also have a fish infusion structure in their society. They live in a large central village, but over time they fish in into small family groups that go out in the jungle and gather resources. And then in times of stress, they tend to come back to that central village and gather up again. So we can always think about how does human food availability shape human social structure, right? Today we have grocery stores and so we live in huge clustered urban areas focused on um, the endpoints of the supply chain, but in previous eras when food supply was less guaranteed, we were more spread out on the landscape and there's been a consistent shift over the last thousand years or so from rural life to urban life to the point where uh, just last was it two, three years ago, um, there were more humans living in cities than humans living outside of cities for the first time in history. And that percentage is always still continuing to shift in the direction of cities. So we can always think about uh, this in a human context as well. All right, so how are primate groups organized internally? Primates tend to have really complex social hierarchies. Of course, we have complex social hierarchies. Uh, we're no exception. One thing that we typically see in primate groups is that higher status males have better fitness. That is, they survive and reproduce more. And that's because they tend to dominate the process of mating. So we'll look at some examples here, but many primate groups, only one male mates with most of the females in the group. Bonobos, again, are an exception to this. Their troops are matriarchal. So um, the females tend to lead the troops and uh, mating happens all over the place. Often within groups, regardless of species, uh, males who are not the dominant male form coalitions with each other to improve their rank and, and try to overthrow the dominant male. So there's a constant process of jockeying for dominance, especially in groups where one male controls most of the females. Um, within groups, we have what are called alliances. So this is a standard affiliative behavior. Um, different individuals make alliances with each other. That might include things like sharing food, sharing parenting responsibilities, protecting each other against other individuals who are rivals within the group. Um, and all of these behaviors indicate that primates have a really good memory for who has been nice to them and who has been mean to them in the past. And how long that past goes back depends on the species. So orangutans, chimpanzees, gorillas have a pretty long memory. Um, smaller animals like the capuchins here have less of a good memory. But a lot of game theory research has therefore focused on primates because we can see their strategies play out in real time uh, in field studies. And again, capuchins on the right there are uh, a focus for that, for that kind of study. They have a lot of interesting affiliative behaviors. So we're going to go through the different types of social organization in primates and what their characteristics are. First example is solitary. So most adults spend their time alone. Adult females, of course, are with their offspring and they have their own territories. And then males have their own territories that overlap with different female territories. So a male will go around in his territory. He may mate with different females at different times, but he doesn't have much to do with his offspring. And meanwhile, you have certain males and certain females who may be out of um, everyone else's territory for certain periods of time. And the big example of this type of organization is orangutans. So they're almost entirely solitary. They only really come together for mating. Uh, and that's, that's the prime example of that. Then you have monogamous uh, social organization. This is where each family group is a pairing of one male and one female uh, with their offspring. And the most common example of this is baboons. So baboons do single male, single female pairing, and they live in large groups, but within those groups, um, each family unit is essentially the same as the nuclear uh, style of, fa of human family unit. And this is what we would call the nuclear family uh, in, in human social organization. Then you have the polyandrous social organization. This is extremely uh, rare. It's mostly only seen in golden lion tamarins. This is where you have one adult female, uh, multiple adult males, and all the resulting offspring. And the, the males don't know 
whose child is whose, so they all parent cooperatively. All the males and the single female take care of all the offspring at the same time. And then they have their group will be isolated from other groups. So golden lion tamarins uh, in the wild live in these polyandrous groups, um, isolated from one another. Then one of the most common groupings that we see in primates is the polygonous group. So this is one male with multiple females. And there are two ways that this can work. You can have single male polygony. That's where you just have one male and then all the females associated with him and then all of their offspring. So all those offspring will probably be the children of that single male, again, because of the infanticide tendency. Uh, and a good example of this is gorillas. Okay. Then you have multiple, multiple male polygony. That's where you have multiple adult males. Each adult male will have multiple adult females associated with him with all their offspring. But then those family units will group up into a larger unit. And a good example of this is many of the New World monkeys have this style of organization. And then you have bachelor groups. So when you look at polygony, right, if polygony is common and many primates live in a social grouping where you have one male with multiple females, you might ask yourself, well, what happens to all the other males who don't have mates? And the answer is that they get booted out of the group and they live either by themselves or in smaller groups that are only males. Um, outside. And often these bachelor groups kind of are around the outside of the territory of the polygonous group and they're constantly trying to get in. So they may come and contest the, the main male for leadership or try to kill him or wait till he dies and then edge in. And they might also try to um, sneak in and mate with the females. And that's one of the main sources of conflict, especially in gorillas. All right, what about communication? So remember that um, primates, apart from us and our direct ancestors, don't have a hyoid bone, right? So they can't articulate complex sounds, but they can make a lot of noise. Uh, you all have a, probably an idea of what a monkey sounds like. And that's an important part of both affiliative behavior and aggressive behavior. So in terms of aggressive behavior, there's often a lot of noise being made. Um, during a threat display, and there are some videos in the video list uh, of that taking place, including one of the howler monkeys here, my favorite primate. On the other hand, you can also use vocalization to communicate uh, with your affiliates. So you can make alarm calls, and vervid monkeys, there's a video on vervid monkeys you should watch. They have a complex system of alarm calls that allows them to identify different kinds of predators and call out to their group members what those predators are and the monkeys then respond appropriately. So if it's a snake, they run up into the trees to get away from it. If it's a leopard, then they run to the ends of the branches to make sure it can't get out there and catch them. If it's an eagle, they hide under the leaves so it can't swoop down and grab them. And what's interesting is that some of these alarm call species um, their calls get learned by both other primate species that live in the same area and even by other animals. So there's some evidence, for instance, that when vervets make a snake call, that some of the other animals in the forest look around as if they were threatened by a snake. And so then we can ask ourselves if, if there's a cognitive basis, if there's a basis in the brain for the development of language already being seen in the behavior of vervet monkeys. And there are a couple of examples that have been documented, for instance, where a juvenile vervet monkey uh, makes the snake alarm call when there are no snakes. And then his mother looks around and doesn't see any snake and then comes over and uh, smacks him, right? As if to say, hey, that's not funny. You know, April 1st is an appropriate date for this, I guess. You know, that's not funny. And he's basically pulling a prank on her. And so if they're able to think about those kinds of things to that degree of complexity, then that might show that the capacity for having a symbol in your mind that represents something and talking about that symbol, even when it's not there, that that is something that is possible even for vervets who are not very smart, right? And therefore also for probably for chimpanzees. And it's often seen as a behavior that makes, that distinguishes humans, that only humans can do. So we're starting to wonder if maybe that capacity already exists in a limited extent, even in primates who are relatively uh, distantly related to us. 
And so then that takes us to an even more complicated question, which is, um, do primates, do non-human primates have culture? So in, in culture and anthropology, you probably learned that what distinguishes us from all the other animals is that we have culture. And there's various definitions of that. Um, but for primates, we, distinguish, we de define culture as group-specific learned behavior that's passed on. So if you think about how you, right, how your culture is constructed, you have behavior that is part of that is your part of your group, right? Whether it's your family background or your ethnicity or your social circle, right? You have behavior that your group does that other groups don't do, and you learned how to do that behavior from somebody else, probably your parents, um, and then that behavior is passed on. Your parents passed it on to you. You probably gonna pass it on to somebody else. Your parents. Got it from your grandparents. And so the question is, do primates fit that definition? And the answer is that they do. Most of what we see as far as primate culture goes relates to food acquisition. And so there's a bunch of different primate behaviors where they use tools to get food. So the three big examples are cracking nuts with stones. Um, chimpanzees do this, but also some of the New World monkeys fishing for termites. So here we have a chimpanzee fishing for termites, which are delicious. They taste kind of like lemon because they have a, a acidic defense reflex. And so what they do is they take a stick and they chew the end of the stick until it's frayed like a brush. And then they stick that in a termite hole there and they wiggle it around and the termites gather, grab onto the frayed part of the stick and the chimpanzee pops it out and sucks off the end of the stick and sucks all the termites off. And we've seen that they pick very specific sticks. So they'll go around and look for the right stick and then modify it just so, so that it does the job correctly. And then finally, there's one group of chimpanzees that's been found making sharp sticks and then jabbing them into holes in tree trunks to kill something called a bush baby, which is also a primate, looks kind of like a small squirrel. So if you imagine, you know, hunting a squirrel with a pointy stick, basically, while it's sleeping, there's one group of chimpanzees that does that. And in all these cases, what's interesting is that that behavior has to be taught. So there are no chimpanzees that just start doing it. It's not an instinct. Um, they have shown by their parents how to do it, and it takes time for them to master it. So there's an interesting video that I didn't put in the video list on uh, these nutcracking monkeys on the bottom right here, where they show the children being shown how to do it, and then trying to do it and failing, and the parents come and correct them and show them you have to hold your hand in a certain position with the rock in order to strike the nut correctly, and then they practice until they get it right. And that's a very human-like behavior, and so that leads us to think that these primates have the same capacity, or at least a similar capacity for culture that, uh, as us. And further research has shown that this knowledge exists in certain groups and not in others. So there are chimpanzees that fish for termites. And then across the river, there might be another group that has never fished for termites, right? And they've never had that knowledge, that technique transferred to them. And so again, that shows that these behaviors are group specific, um, which again, fits into the definition of culture. So... That is the lecture, like I said, a little brief, but there is a number of videos on that playlist that I'd like you to look at. For homework this week, regardless of which lab, uh, lab manual you have, the questions are the same. Do exercises number one, and then three through six. And again, use the appendices uh, that are provided in the lab manual. If you don't have access to those, let me know. Skip exercise two, it's live primate observation, which of course we can't do because even if there was a zoo in Las Vegas with primates, which there isn't, it would be closed. So we're not gonna do that. However, in the additional materials page, I have provided several webcams uh, to primate exhibits in zoos across the country. And I encourage you to take a look at them. I'm not even sure if all those zoos are letting their primates out right now, but they probably are for exercise. And so if you get a chance to observe the primates, it's a great time because there's no tourists um, interfering with them. So if you have a chance, take a look at those, but it's not required. Now that's just enrichment. As usual, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm available in all the usual ways. Uh, and I hope everyone is staying safe and doing well. Um, 
we'll try to get through the rest of the semester as smoothly as possible. Oh, and also I have posted the updated syllabus. So take a look at that. We're just going to stretch everything out a little bit to fill up that week where I was going to be gone. Uh, the final will still be on the same day. It will be online on Canvas instead of being a paper final. So have a great rest of your day and I will talk to you all later.